Dr. Horowitz is professor of medicine in the um, David Geffen School of Medicine, Division of Cardiology, and the co-director of the UCLA Evolutionary Medicine Program and its master's degree program. She's also a visiting professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard University. Dr. Horowitz's book, Wildhood, which won the Association for Science Education Book of the Year Award in 2020, uses the lenses of evolutionary biology, neuroscience, and animal behavior to understand the species-spanning challenges of growing up. And since her visit with us in October 2012, um, where she talked about her book, 2012 book, Ubiquity, um, she, her work has flourished in both scientific and popular sectors. Um, the um, book Ubiquity, Astonishing Connection Between Human and Animal Health garnered multiple awards. It was the New York Times bestseller, a finalist for the Excellence in Science Books Award, a Smithsonian top book of 2012 and Discover Magazine's best book of the year. And it has been translated into seven languages and chosen as a common read at universities across the country. She's been very busy since then, and we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Horowitz about her latest work. So welcome, Dr. Horowitz. Okay, and the sounds all right? Yes. We're good to be here. And um, yeah, I want to just jump in and spend um, maybe 40, maybe 45 minutes talking about some of the research and the findings and then open it up to conversation. So I really want this to be interactive. Uh, and with that, I will start to share my screen. So there, I hope that there you wow. go. <laughs> now we have an adolescent King Bang. Well, this is actually an adolescent. And um, one of the things I love about this is I have so many videos of wild animal adolescents at this point, it's ridiculous. I just, I love this uh, particular penguin for, for reasons that have to do with the book itself and our research. But it's the, um, it, it, I think that the, the essence of adolescence is captured um, here. It's the, who am I? Uh, you can see the mature white plumage that is um, peeking through and, and you can still see the juvenile furry, um, the, 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 the brown plumage um, that's just kind of still, still there. So it's this, who am I? Um, the, the confusion, the questions, all of the unresolved issues of adolescence in our species to me is captured in this particular penguin. Well, all of my work centers around a single idea, and that is that our approach to medicine uh, and psychiatry and the human condition has been very anthropocentric, right? We've been very human-centered. But that by adopting a more species-spanning approach and then ultimately considering the evolutionary biology that connects um, us to animals in, comes, when it comes to our health, our vulnerability to physical, psychiatric illnesses, and so much more, we're able to understand um, many aspects of the human condition that we can't if we have this human-focused anthropocentric lens. But in order to do this, um, I'm going to ask you today to do something that I ask all of my students to do on the first day of every class that I give, and that is to check your human exceptionalism at the door. And that is because human exceptionalism is a blindfold. And I believe it is a blindfold that prevents us, has prevented us as scientists, as physicians, in so many ways, just as human beings from recognizing connections across species that were they seen would allow us to understand things much better. Well, I'm gonna make the case today, I hope to make the case in 40 minutes that by looking across species, by looking across evolutionary time, by peeling off the blindfold of human exceptionalism, we can better understand much about adolescence. And specifically, I'm gonna suggest that we can better understand why adolescents take so many risks. Uh, we'll talk about the startlingly uh, high mortality rates among human adolescents. We're gonna apply this broadly comparative and evolutionary lens also to understand why adolescence is a period of such vulnerability to mental illness. At least half to three quarters of all mental illnesses that will affect an individual in their life will present before or during adolescence. And adolescence, um, we defined uh, as 
from the beginning of puberty until the four core competencies that we present in the book um, have been mastered. So for humans, that varies. In general, we're talking about the 20s, so puberty through the 20s. And finally, this broadly comparative and evolutionary lens can help us understand why human adolescents are so vulnerable to exploitation and several kinds of exploitation. Well, that's a tall order and I have now I think about 38 minutes. So here's the plan. I am going to use this lens to ask why adolescents take risks, why they um, are so vulnerable to mental illness, why they are so vulnerable to exploitation. And I'll start by very quickly sharing a little bit about my journey and how I arrived at this particular um, formulation, this approach to adolescence. I'll share some of the insights that um, emerged during the research and writing of Wildhood, and then open it up to a Q&A discussion, hopefully some interesting conversations. So uh, I actually finished medical school and uh, started my career at UCLA as a psychiatry resident. I did a full psychiatry residency at uh, the Neuropsychiatric Institute and um, uh, for a year was an attending, a, a clinical instructor. And then I decided I really wanted to um, be an internal medicine doctor. And I went back and I retrained in internal medicine. I did a cardiology fellowship. And then I came on faculty um, uh, at in sometime in the, in the early 90s. And I've just stayed at UCLA since that time, uh, practicing uh, cardiology, doing a lot of teaching, and primarily focusing on um, imaging, cardiac imaging. Um, some of you who've read Zubiquity, um, I may have given a talk, I gave the talk to this group before, know that what happened was a very simple serendipitous thing. Um, I was busy practicing, you know, medicine and uh, at UCLA doing, reading lots and lots of echocardiograms, doing lots and lots of, car of um, echocardiography studies. Uh, when I got a call from the Los Angeles Zoo that they had a chimpanzee who had a cardiovascular event. Anyway, I started, um, be I became a cardiovascular consultant to the Los Angeles Zoo and participated in the care of um, a wide range of patients. This was actually one of the first patients. Uh, this is a gorilla, that was a chimpanzee. This of course is a gorilla. Uh, I eventually graduated beyond the primates. I, I think I imaged many to most of those primates and um, uh, eventually participating in the care of a, a really broad range of mammals and birds and even reptiles. So this uh, really opened up um, my mind a lot and um, was the first time that I began to even consider that I had a, <laughs> an anthropocentric blindfold. Um, but it, it really changed uh, how I approached things. This was actually a procedure on that, that lion. I forgot I had this slide in there. Um, we actually drained that lion's heart of like 700 cc's of fluid and this was a post-operative check and the procedure was it's it's a procedure that, a procedure that's done in humans um as well of course except there's no paw and no tail so anyway that snuck in there so i had the great great good fortune to um work start working with Catherine bowers who is a brilliant animal behaviorist and she's um a naturalist and the two of us have spent now over a decade um exploring the natural world for insights into human health and um, Zubiquity was our first book. We um, also created conferences to bring together veterinary schools, medical schools, to begin conversations about the shared vulnerabilities across species. And the first Zubiquity conference, and now they've they have happened all over the world. And um, uh, but we're very proud. The first was at UCLA, and this this is the handshake. The dean of the vet school at UC Davis, and the then Dean of the Medical School. Um, but initially our book, Zubiquity, was going to be a book only about physical illnesses, right? It was going to be cancer and heart disease, autoimmune disorders, infertility, et cetera, et cetera. But as we became more familiar with the world of veterinary medicine, we were encountering lots and lots of psychopathology. So mental illness, biobehavioral disorders in a wide range of animals. Uh, this particular polar bear uh, video is an example of a stereotypy. It's a repetitive compulsion. In this particular example, um, the, the um, compulsion is entrained. The two animals have entrained. And um, so ultimately, we had, um, we had half the chapters in the book um, pertaining to mental illness. And I must say, this is a, a, a very heavy re area of research for me right now looking um, at comparative psychopathology for a, a wide range of insights, including ways to better understand human mental illness um, 
to destigmatize um, uh, what and stigma remains such a significant issue um, in in human mental illness. But in any event, the book was half physical illness and half mental illnesses, and we had a chapter on adolescence. Well, um, before I kind of jump into the adolescent part of this story, um, a very big question that I had, and it was an it remained unanswered for me for many years, was how to use this experience. Um, uh, being with veterinarians, um, conferences, collaborating with vets, how to use that experience to um, make me a better physician, to make me a better medical educator um, or investigator. And ultimately, I, I found inspiration in the um, work of Nicholas Tinbergen. And Nico Tinbergen was a Dutch biologist. He was an animal behaviorist. Uh, he studied fish and he studied birds. But he and two others were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1973. And among his many contributions was a central foundational concept. And that was this, that in biology, in order to explain anything, the typical reductionistic mechanistic explanations were inadequate. In order to understand why, truly understand why, Descriptive explanations were inadequate. What one needed was an evolutionary explanation. And another way of thinking about an evolutionary explanation is an explanation that provides an understanding of how that behavior, how that component of biology increased the evolutionary fitness of that animal. In other words, how it was adaptive. Well, in order to understand how a piece of biology is adaptive, Tinbergen asserted one needed to look phylogenetically, that is broadly comparatively. And that essentially was the insight that led me to look at over the last 10 years, um, a wide range of heart disease, uh, cancers, um, many, many disorders, but now adolescence. And we're gonna get to that in just a moment. So. Let's go to this question of why. Why do adolescent, why do human adolescents take so many risks? And this is an extreme example, but as I started um, really getting into the literature, it is a, a real thing. There is um, a, a wide range of, of risk-taking activity that we see. And in many cases, it's activity that, that young people wouldn't take if they were on their own. But with others, they seem to have a reduced risk, risk threshold. This is a recent tragic example of that sort of thing. Well, let's look at the statistics. We see that between the ages of 12 and 19, human adolescents do have a dramatic rise in mortality. Death rates for teenagers rise from almost sixfold. And that is a very, very puzzling question. Why is that? Now, before um, I began looking at all aspects of medicine through a broadly comparative and evolutionary lens through what I now call my Tinbergian lens, I, um, I would have answered that question um, with um, a description of some of the unique characteristics of the adolescent brain. And I'm guessing most of you have, have knowledge of that. And, um, and in fact, there, there are many um, characteristics of the human adolescent brain, which are unique to that phase of development. The one that's best known, of course, is the late development of the prefrontal cortex. So this is a, um, the PFC is the prefrontal cortex. And in this in, uh, image, the striatum is sort of a, a structure that um, is going to, this and other structures, let's say, are going to be the source of the impulses um, and the desires in a sense. And the PFC is sort of the governor, the restrainer, the stop sign. And that by the time a, a human is an adult, the PFC is, is well developed and functions to sort of, you know, tamp down and contain those impulses, those urges that might lead to the kind of risk taking that we see. But during adolescence, um, it's not quite there. And so this has sort of been a very, um, a very now has become a very widespread explanation 
for why, and I'm doing air quotes on my why, adolescents take so many risks. Well, what's interesting, and by the way, one of the funny things is that I love this New Yorker cartoon. Um, young man, go to your room and stay there until your cerebral cortex matures. And the reason that I love this is that I, I teach a course um, for several years at Harvard for undergraduates called Coming of Age on Planet Earth. Actually, this is the first time I've been teaching it at UCLA. We're in the class right now. But um, when I've asked the students why adolescents take risks, they almost in unison say, oh, adolescents have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. Like there's this, this um, you know, widespread knowledge about this, even among adolescents, although they don't consider themselves adolescents, but I do. Um, and so the question is, if, if you have, the way I see it, if you have only a, an anthropocentric approach, then yes, um, an exp the only possible explanation that one can have is to look reductively at neuroscience and get some insights from lab animals, but essentially, um, without kind of um, without a, an ecological context. But as one begins to look at risk taking in adolescence across species and then begins to apply an evolutionary lens, specifically asking questions about how risk taking might be adaptive, that is to say, are there aspects of the neurobiology associated with risk taking in animal adolescence that increases their chance of survival, that increases their reproductive um, success. Once you do that, things start to change. And so this question, this inexplicable, I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes no sense, right, that, that a pre-reproductive animal is going to have such high mortality. And there's a lot of debate about that, but it certainly is a question. Well, one of the first things that I did was to um, conduct a systematic review um, looking for evidence of increased evidence or the absence of evidence of increased mortality among non-human adolescent animals. And this took a long time and I had lots and lots of students. And um, But what ultimately we found was that across chordates, across vertebrate species from fish through birds, animals in this phase of life, uh, that is who have gone through puberty or who have entered puberty, but have not yet mastered these four core competencies um, are at increased risk of dying. It is a very dangerous period of life. Um, here are some of the um, interesting things that we researched and, and put into the book. Uh, we looked at some of the large series that evaluate roadkill. So roadkill is a, um, you know, it's a real threat to wildlife in some parts of the world. In the U.S., there are at least one million animals who die daily uh, from, you know, who are hit by automobiles and and um, studies that have looked at who these animals are consistently show that um, adolescents are overrepresented. They are disproportionately the victims of, of um, a car accident, of, of traffic accidents. Um, one other sad one, and then we'll get out of the sad stuff and get into a little bit more hopeful, but I think it is, uh, it, it's, I think, profound that, um, it, I think as a human being, it's impossible to see this stuff and not think about the parallel experience in, in human life. But whale strikes, right, which of course are um, an increasing issue with busy shipping corridors. Uh, whales have been given a little bit of a reprieve during COVID, but again, disproportionately, uh, young whales who are, no, who are old enough to be um, outside of the direct uh, care and protection of mother, but who lack the experience in this case to apparently sense the, um, the vibrations associated with women. So all of a sudden now we are seeing that um, because we are now Tinbergian and we've moved away from our homo sapien centrism and we've, we are looking at this comparative perspective, this shared developmental vulnerability to increase mortality. And the question is, why? Why? Well, there are a number of reasons that um, we were able to identify in other species, and I think some of them do apply to our species as well. 
So one of the reasons that adolescent animals have such high mortality is that they're easy prey. There are many species we put into the book, I think a half dozen, but we were able to find, I mean, 20 different predatory species who selectively target adolescent uh, animals selectively target the bigs migrating orcas uh, this is an ecotype of um, uh, orca and they uh they selectively target the adolescents uh the calves it is believed are going to be closely protected by and often a, um, a a consort a bull uh the uh the adults are are hard to take on they're experienced and they're big but the adolescents uh, often are on their own, they may be with other adolescents in these pods, and they lack experience to see what's coming. And so there's this selective predation, this targeting of adolescents. Um, we write quite extensively about this um, term predator naive or predator naivete, and this is a term that we got from the wildlife biologist to describe uh, animals who have had inadequate exposure to uh, dangers and predators and who are at extremely high risk and very often predator naive animals are adolescent animals. Again, we're talking about birds who are, uh, who are, who have entered puberty and are physically old enough and big enough to leave the nest. So be outside of parental protection, but they lack experience. And so they are easy prey. They are predator naive and it's a very dangerous condition. Uh, just to give you um, a sense on the paper of the about the big orcas and these humpback carcasses, uh, this was in uh, Kodiak, off Kodiak Island um, in 2006 to, to 2012. Uh, the carcasses that were found, and these were all um, big, uh, bigs, um, uh, big orcas uh, kills. You have subadult, 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 right? I mean, you have one adult and two calves, and interestingly, they. Um, the method of, of killing deprives the adolescent animals of uh, alarm calling, which is uh, one of the ways that they can summon help. So um, it's interesting. Now, inexperience is, um, is the same as being predator naive, and it, it contributes to makes you, it makes you, puts you at risk when you're inexperienced. Uh, this, I just love this video. I'm going to set it up and I'll show it once, maybe twice, but I want to get moving on to some other things. Um, so I think you're all familiar with the, the iconic uh, crossing of the Mara River by the wildebeest, right? You know, there are these tens of thousands of wildebeest that stream, <laughs> stream toward the Mara River. And where they cross, of course, that's where the crocodiles converge. And that's where they are going to be, you know, getting their meals, their prey. And what I want you to um, focus on is it's think that think of how hot it is there. Think of how long they have been walking without water, how thirsty they are. And what you'll begin to see, I'll point it out, is younger, smaller, lither wildebeests leaping into the water like woo water, woo, just jumping in. And you'll you'll see that first. But then I'm going to show it again. And I'm going to direct your attention not to, away from the young, um, enthusiastic wildebeest who are jumping in, but toward these older, larger, mature wildebeest. And you'll see their feet, you'll see their hoofs, how they are backing up every time one jumps in as though they are anticipating a crocodile leaping out, right? We've all seen this. And to me, these few seconds of video capture the difference between being predator naive, a wildebeest at the Mara River for the first time, and um, a wildebeest who, for whom this is not their first time at the Mara River. Okay, here we go, jumping in. It's, um, there's another one leaping, leaping, and leaping. All right, now we're gonna watch again. And this time I want you to, right here where I'm, okay, there, the youngsters will get out of the way and you'll be able to see right here. Do you see this, right? Nothing is happening, but they know that's experience. Was everyone able to see what I was pointing out? Great. So gaining experience is critically important. And um, one of the um, risk-taking behaviors, and I'm gonna call it that because that is what it looks like when you're looking at it in wild animals, that actually is an adaptation that allows animals to become safer 
the adolescent animals to become safer is something called predator inspection. So predator inspection is a behavior you see uh, more in adolescent animals than in older animals, although many animals do it throughout the lifespan. And this is where an animal typically with others, not alone, approaches a predator instead of fleeing from a predator. Approaches the predator, smells, watches, listens, uh, and at, at risk, at their peril. I mean, is associated with a certain mortality for the adolescent animals who are moving toward danger. The first of two video examples I'm going to show of predator inspection um, is of a meerkat. You'll see an adolescent meerkat approaching a Cape Cobra. He'll be joined by others. Uh, again, it's a mixed age group, and they will um, circle the cobra. And it's clear what it, um, one of the best studied species when it comes to predator inspection are Thompson gazelle. And Thompson gazelle are um, preyed upon by a number of predators, but cheetah are among their um, most significant predator uh, predators. In this video, you'll see a young and then another young Thompson gazelle approach rather than flee from uh, two cheetahs and then actually a third shows up. And then you'll see a whole group of the gazelle literally staring at the cheetah. And some of it is um, a kind of an intimidation, but it's primarily predator inspection. There's our young Thompson gazelle moving toward the cheetahs. She's paused. The others have paused. It's a multi-age group. And um, anyway, I guess I clipped out when the third cheetah comes, but you get the picture, predator inspection. Now, I wonder and um, if we can begin looking at the way predator inspection works and the neurobiology that underlies predator inspection to help us better understand why adolescent individuals, we're talking about humans who wouldn't take certain risks on their own when they are with other adolescents um, seem to be more willing to do so. In other words, why their risk-taking threshold falls. And before we answer that question or we have a conversation about it perhaps, um, remember that predator inspection is adaptive. It's what Nico Tinbergen would call an adaptive behavior. How do we know that? Because studies, there was a, a, a remarkable woman who, who spent decades studying uh, Thompson Gazelle. This is a, Fitzgibbon was her name. And she studied predator inspection, accounting the number of approaches an adolescent made versus an adult made, and, and literally keeping track of the mortality. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of approaches. And her conclusion was that while there was an increased risk and danger to the life of these uh, gazelle through this behavior, that the gazelle who did this actually had higher survival. In other words, they were safer as adults. So Tinbergen would then say, well, that that would be an adaptive behavior. It increases the survival and consequently the reproductive potential for that animal. And so um, consider that predator inspection in the case of the Thompson gazelle and in the case of the adolescent animals come into contact with their peers, that there is a neurobiological change that uh, reduces their risk-taking threshold and facilitates the, this behavior that they might, that the, the neurobiology um, of, of being on your own might not facilitate. So all of a sudden, it, it starts to take on risk taking or at least predator inspection starts to take on a different uh, kind of tone. And the head scratching um, mystery of why adolescents, why adolescents who literally, I mean, this is um, one of the things that is so tragic about the, uh, that, that newspaper um, account I showed you a few minutes ago from February uh, that's so heartbreaking is I, I was reading the report and I mean he's just like the students that we have I mean you know college students UCLA students are brilliant and they have worked so hard and they're responsible and they generally good judgment so you know why um, the presence of peers can um, 
can shift judgment so profoundly is such a, a important question. And I think that, that um, we can get some clues from the animal, the world of animals. Well, I wanna spend just um, um, a few minutes um, thinking about vulnerability uh, to mental illness. And, uh, you know, this is, this is something that, um, you know, if you ask parents what they're worried about um, in their adolescence, you know, people, mo the first answer usually, uh, and I, you know, my kids are now in their, in their mid twenties, but I remember being very scared about accidents, very scared driving. What was, it was horrible, but it, you know, and it remains really scary. Um, and then being parents worry about their kids' mental health. The, the rates of anxiety and depression, as you all know, are rising. Um, there are a number of, of um, uh, explanations for that that have been offered, social media, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very significant. The leading cause of death um, is our accidents among uh, adolescents. But um, but in certain populations, um, suicide, be suicidal behavior, suicide is, is high. So mental illness is a, a very great concern of parents. And in fact, what's notable is that uh, during human adolescence, um, the, the brain is vulnerable in a way that it, um, is, uh, it is more vulnerable to the onset of mental illness than at any other uh, time in life. And um, as we know, that is, um, we're talking about everything from affective disorders, eating disorders, um, um, substance abuse, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the clues that we can get, um, that we can learn about, um, about um, mental, the vulnerability to mental illness from the animal world has to do with the reality that animals, uh, social animals, so I'm talking about fish, I'm talking about birds, and I'm talking about mammals, live in groups and groups um, groups of animals, uh, hierarchies emerge. In fact, it is an emergent property of group living animals uh, to have uh, status-based hierarchies. They're, they're not necessarily linear. There's, there's you know, a whole field devoted to the nature of animal hierarchies. But the, the point is that this, um, this idea that to be a social animal is to live in a group where you have a rank, where you have um, a relative position. And the word status is the word that we use in the book. Um, what I want you to just think about for a few minutes as we consider how this broad comparative and evolutionary framework can help us better understand adolescent vulnerability to, to mental illness is to consider that um, in the animal world, being at the top of a hierarchy that is having high status or rising in status, status elevation raises an animal's uh, survival and reproduction, the definition of evolutionary fitness. And on the other hand, falling in status, what's called status descent, reduces an animal's survival and reproduction. So animals who are at the top of a uh, animal uh, social hierarchy are going to have greater access to food. They are going and higher quality food. They may have a greater access to the safest positions in the herd, um, in the flock, in the school. They may have better nesting sites, uh, more access to mates, etc. So. Uh, gaining in status is evolutionarily, it is adaptive, right? It is fitness enhancing. And all sensation, and this is, so these are, this is sort of the sequence of explaining, which, which you kind of have to know to, to see this connection, that all sensation evolved to shape animal behavior in ways that increase evolutionary fitness. So the, what we feel, what animals feel, sensation evolved to shape behavior, to promote evolutionary fitness. So physical pain, right? Evolved to promote behavior to keep animals from harm, right? You think about a hot stove, a hand near the stove, pull back, and there's the pain is part of learning. Physical pleasure on the other end of things evolved to promote behavior that promotes survival and reproduction, eating, sex, et cetera. You get the point. Well. Emotional pain, and I'm using the word emotional, yes, in applied to non-human animals, that's a whole other conversation, but I'm going to, um, evolved to avoid status descent. 
emotional pain evolved to shape behavior that helps an animal avoid status descent and emotional pleasure evolved to reinforce status elevating behavior. And consider for a moment what it feels like to be humiliated, to experience status descent, what it feels like to get a bad grade, to um, lose, to, um, to be shamed, to lose status. And then consider the pleasure we have when we get an A plus, um, whatever, you, you, you get the picture. But these sensations and the ancient social brain networks that evolved hundreds of millions of years ago um, in one of the um, phylogenetic analyses that I did uh, to look at this issue, I was able to identify a number of, of um, crustacean species in which the serotonergic networks that underlie these, these uh, social brain systems um, functioned to help promote an animal's ability to navigate. But these ancient social brain networks evolved to help animals navigate social relationships. Remember, when you see a school of fish, they all kind of look the same, but they're not. They're individuals. And each one of those fish has a relationship with every other fish in that, in that school. And these social brain systems, these underlie human vulnerability to depression and anxiety. In other words, there is a connection between those systems, those ancient systems that have evolved to help non-human social animals navigate social relationships, um, we humans retain, we have significant, con significantly conserved neurobiology of those systems. And it turns out that adolescence um, is a period in which status determining contests um, happen more frequently and are of greater consequence. And really, if you think about all of the wildlife uh, movies you've seen and all of these, the, what you could call them fights, but they're really status determining contests. This is a, this is a hierarchy that is being established. And uh, this is actually um, an example of, you can see who's being pushed to the bottom of the hierarchy here, right? And so on and so forth. And um, the two, I'm going to wrap things up in a moment so we can have a conversation. But to make things, um, to make something that's pretty complicated in some ways, but on the other hand, um, I think has a, a, a very simple message that um, is very helpful, I think, for understanding um, the evolution of these brain systems and how, how that connects to, to um, our human vulnerability. These, these, they're really serotonergic systems. Um, when two fish come together for a contest, which doesn't have to be a fight, a lot of what you see among social animals is, is checking each other out, who is bigger, who is smaller. Um, there's a hierarchy that may be established without a fight. Um, but when these two fish come together, uh, let's say fish A wins, and fish A, fish B loses, their, their neurobiology changes. In other words, they, the, the impact of losing, of coming out on the lower end of things, and the impact of winning changes the brains, changes the neurobiology of the animal, changes their behavior. And what we see over time is um, with these fish experiments, the fish that lose um, sequentially over and over, they, their neurobiology, um, is altered and they become um, more, they don't move as much, they don't initiate activity as much, they become kind of withdrawn. Whereas the winner fish are, uh, looks like they're doing victory dances. So I'll quickly show you this video. Um, these are fish right when they're about to start their little contest. And um, uh, you can see, I hope, that the fish that has won is quite active. The, the fish on the bottom right of the tank is, um, the gills are moving, but it's really very um, withdrawn. And so um, what is very interesting to me is that these serenergic pathways, these social brain networks are so conserved among the animals in which we see the, um, these, these contests that during adolescence and beyond, but these highly consequential status determining contests. And, and it turns out if we look at human adolescence, 
this vulnerability to to depression and to anxiety. And we look at um, such things as social media and begin to cast them in, in human animal terms. Um, social media, for example, is really a status determining contest. It's how many likes do I have? Um, it's, it's filters, it's, the, it's a comparison experience. And the neurobiology that accompanies comparison experiences is ancient and the roots of, of the neurobiology of, of human dysphoria, I believe, can be found in those systems that are so highly conserved in our species. Um, we, it's it's 15, hour, 15 minutes after the hour, and I want to have time to um, have a conversation uh, more broadly. But just to, to point out that one of the great uh, risks to adolescents and, and this you know, some adolescents are more vulnerable than others, you know, issues of privilege come into play, but um, uh, adolescents are very vulnerable to um, trafficking, uh, sex trafficking, um, exploitation, but even just sexual assault, sexual assault itself. And in fact, um, when we look at um, the highest uh, the age at, of highest risk, um, we're talking about the 11 to 19 year old um, period. We know that freshmen in college are more likely to experience sexual assault uh, than uh, sophomore, junior, or senior students. Again, likely related to some of the issues we talked about earlier. Um, but there's this vulnerability. And I'll just share a couple of um, insights. Um, uh, you know, sexual assault, uh, rather sexual um, coercion does occur in the animal world. And um, the um, most vulnerable animals are often the younger animals. Um, and then in a really uh, interesting, I'm gonna move past this to, um, sorry, let me, one last, um, uh, point is right here. Well, I'll just tell you about it and then I'll go off of um, off of the, the screen and we'll talk a little bit and I can show you more videos if we want to. But um, there, you know, it's pretty well known now that, uh, you know, puberty, uh, puberty is coming earlier for many boys and girls, but more women, more girl, young girls than um, boys. But, um, and there are a number of factors, right? We're looking at, you know, body mass and nutrition, um, there may be, you know, stress, endocrine disrupting chemicals, lots of possible contributing factors for early puberty. We also know is that um, girls who have early puberty are at significantly increased risk of being the victims of sexual molestation. And when this happens, they, um, there are many downstream, negative downstream consequences um, from, you know, depression and other affective disorders to poor school performance to um, substances to dropping out. I mean, it's, it's highly consequential. And um, one of the most interesting connective studies that I found um, uh, came from the primate, the, the American Journal of Primatology, a study that looked at ring-tailed lemur, um, young ring-tailed lemur females. So the ring-tailed lemur are a um, they're, you know, Madagascar, the lemurs are from Madagascar, and, but, the, but this particular species of, of lemur, it is a female dominant um, species, right? There are you know, spotted hyenas and there, there are a few of them, but the ringtail lemur, it's a female dominant society. And um, although sexual coercion, you know, is, 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 has been seen in a wide range of, of mammalian and other species, in female dominant species, it's very rare. And in fact, um, in this paper that was looking at these, these lemur, they noted that um, male coercive sexual behavior had not been documented in this species until um, there, there is a you know, lemur from Madagascar, but there's a, a large colony, an historic colony of lemur um, on an island off of Georgia. Uh, it's called uh, St. Catherine's Island. And uh, there, the lemur, there's some human provisioning. So they, um, the young lemur, are their, their body mass ind indices are higher than they would be in Madagascar, where it's hard to get the calories. And um, normally, um, it takes about two years for, in Madagascar, it takes two years for a female ringtail to reach a maturity. And by that time, by the time her body 
she has learned the behaviors of dominance, right? She knows how to act like a female, you know, a, a, an adult dominant ringtail, uh, female ringtail lemur. But in uh, off the, you know, in this island, the females are physically going through puberty a year early because presumably because they're heavier. And what is now happening is their bodies are mature, but they haven't learned the suite of dominance behaviors that they would, that they evolved. You know, the, the, the evolution of the species, there was this uh, kind of um, synergy of the social knowledge and the, the physiologic development, but now it's off. And so for the first time they're seeing um, sexual coercion on these females. So that was really kind of another one of these interesting parallels that has to do with, again, vulnerability. So um, I'm going to stop now and just to kind of recap that the central theme of all of my work is that um, the field of medicine has been operating with this narrow, um, this narrow anthropocentric lens. Um, that has really been a blindfold. And in my own life, in my own work, um, I've just experienced this expanded aperture as, as very, very powerful in seeing and resolving and, and clarifying. Um, and when it comes to adolescence, uh, this has been really an eye opener for me. I wish that I wish uh, many times it took us about five years to, to do this project. Um, by then, my kids were already kind of, you know, out of the house. But um, yeah, it, it, every time we do one of these projects, it transforms us. And I think as a parent, looking back, um, uh, I think I could have been a better parent in some ways. But in any way, I'm going to stop. And I hope you have questions. And um, and I'm want to hear from you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, so many questions. Uh, we have lots of time. So please use the chat function to um, enter your questions. And I'm gonna take the ones that we have begun to receive so far. Uh, so first I wanna ask, um, uh, Joan Ophoff has asked, does the risk-taking behavior have the same rate in males and females, or is there a difference in the amount of risk-taking between males and females? It's such a great question, um, and I don't know. We don't know. We we from the very beginning because I mean the you're asking undoubtedly because you're aware of the human um, the, the male and female difference in our species, um, but we we really couldn't find any reliable literature. One of the things that is it's it's both exciting and frustrating when we go into the animal literature is. Um, is the blind spots that are are I think that those blind spots are being sort of change now. I mean, there's more light on things and but um, not recording what the sex what you know, whether an animal is male or female, um, the assumption in some of the literature that animals are male, just by default. Uh, so I, the answer is we don't know. And well, I'm sure that's going to be the subject of more study <laughs> as a result. Yeah, um, and a lot of the on, on the mortality stuff, a lot of that was from the the um, avian literature, and and you know there isn't that much in some of those species. There's not that much sexual dimorphism. I mean, th some bird species obviously there is. So so I think some of the time they really just didn't know. Got it. Um, so Zorana asks another question: Is risk factor correlated with cultural variables or other variables? Um, I, what are the associations for risk fact taking risk? Yeah, no, we, that also. So, what about countries where kids don't have access to cars, right? So, do we see the same uh, risk? And um, and by the way, you know, um, I didn't show you the the actual CDC chart, charts, but you know, access to gun. I mean, we know that you know. So so having access to um, instruments that are associated with, you know, mortality where risk equals catastrophe versus risk equals experience. Um, yeah, that undoubtedly that is the case. We were unable, there, there is, um, there is a, um, there is the belief that this is a fundamental uh, characteristic independent of culture because of the basic science that supports the impulsivity um, and um, et cetera. So the neurobiology that is associated with the risk taking that's associated with the increased mortality is culture. 
presumably. Um, so, but but we've we've looked at this before and, and we have been asked that question. So again, great question. <laughs> well, uh, kind of a segue. Another question on that uh, vein is uh, from Velma. How do we know the brain is changed as a consequence of losing and winning? Right. What, what uh, is the measurement there? Oh, it's so interesting. So there we. Um, this was so exciting. We we found so there are in the um, fish literature and in the uh, actually some of it is in the crustacean literature and a little less in the bird literature. They actually look at the impact of social descent, right? So they look at um, and some of these some of these studies are fascinating. So they basically look at what happens to these serotonergic systems when an animal. Uh, is you know winning or losing right and you know they do the typical things they have um they sacrifice the fish and then they look at their brains and they and they see that those things um change they also uh they also do inter very interesting things like they so the serotonergic um networks these are not the only networks that are involved with you know generating mood in humans obviously it's complex but but serotonergic systems are involved in our in the shaping of human moods we know that um, at a very entry level um, position because of the of SSRIs, right? The, I mean, Prozac was, the year that I started my psychiatry residency was the year that Prozac, right? Fluoxetine, the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor to come into the, into the American market. You know, the blockbuster drug that really many people feel sparked, you know, the true biological revolution in psychiatry. That's a serotonergic, right? Selective serotonergic reuptake inhibitor, serotonin, serotonin, serotonin. And what they do is they sometimes they, they have these fish that, that, that have repetitive losses. They look at what happens to their brains. They do the same things with, have been with lobster, with cr uh, different crayfish. And then they put Prozac or Prozac-like drugs, SSRIs in the water. And the fish that have the loser fish, you know, you can't ask the fish how they feel, and they're not going to tell you how they feel, but their behavior changes um, from, uh, they, they become less withdrawn and they become more physically active and they, they engage more. And that's, you know, that whole experimental, um, that collection of experimental literature to me is a very compelling arrow um, pointing to the connective tissue between these ancient, you know, fish brains that evolved for to help these individual fish relate to each other, um, that there's connective tissue between that and the modern human experience of, of feeling sad. Um, okay, well, now, uh, another question uh, is, how can we help our young adults to alter their behavior based on what you have found? I well, presume to mitigate risk. Yeah, no, it's a, um, so here's, here's a story. I, I, uh, I remember when um, our son was learning to drive and you know that period. So first of all, you know how we have the the the, the graduated uh, driver's license. So they they get the license and they that you have to be in the car for I don't know if it's six I can't remember if it's six months or a year, and then they can drive but they can't drive with their friends in the car, right? Okay, so there's all that. So in the first period, when they had that training license, they they want to drive all the time, right? So I remember one night my son said, "Oh, let's should we go driving?" And it was raining outside. It was like one of those storms and it was windy and it was really raining. And I thought, you know, we, we live off of sunset. And I just thought, you know, Charlie, let's, it's, you know, let's do it tomorrow. It'll be dry. And um, as, as we were writing the book, um, I started thinking about that experience. I'm sure there are more dramatic experiences. I just can't remember, but, uh, and thinking that is exactly the wrong, that was exactly the wrong choice that actually what, what you see and and with animal parenting and how animals learn about danger and actually become safe is um is experiencing danger with um encountering danger with experienced con specifics so so if in terms of the potency of learning behavior when it comes to being safe um the first is a near miss 
survive a near miss, then that you learn a lot. But that's a pretty risky way to learn. But a second way to learn is through um, basically hanging out with experienced conspecifics. And um, one of the, we, we wrote a lot about the experience of, of farm salmon and wild salmon and these smolts, right? So smolts are basically adolescent salmon. And um, the farmed adolescents who haven't been in, in, you know, in a, they haven't encountered any predators. They can't even smell. They're, the pike, uh, which are a predator, give, give off a smell, but the that the wild adolescent salmon can pick up at a distance, but the but the <laughs> the farmed smolt are just completely naive, and they can have like a 90, 95 percent mortality. But in some of these, some of the aqua uh, culture folks started putting wild caught smolt with the farm smolt, so they were kind of hanging out with street smart or stream smart, I don't know, uh, peers, and their behavior changed that is the they, and they actually had higher survival so i think i think avoiding all danger is the probably the most dangerous thing that can happen to a wild animal so keeping them away from problems is not the way to keep them safe yeah unless you can be sure that they're you know that they're not going to encounter any of those problems later on <laughs> right right um so i i have a question and it relates to our most recent COVID epidemic. Um, do you have any um, additional thoughts about the issues of isolation and food insecurity and their impact on adolescents as a result of this COVID-19 epidemic? Um, it, it, it's been such a concern how many people have been struggling to have enough food um, and the risk behaviors that come with that probably. Um, but also this isolation that they've had um, with screen time, but not much interaction socially. Right. Yeah, well, to take the first part of that, yeah, the food insecurity piece. So the Urban Institute published this uh, white paper about five years ago, looking at um, adolescent, adolescents in America and found that um, it was something like seven to nine percent of adolescents had such sufficient daily food insecurity that they had to engage in risky activities, including um, selling, in some cases, selling drugs, some, some transactional sexual um, activity to get food, like actually. So, and, and part of the reason that that became, uh, I use that in one of my classes because if, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't realize what food insecurity does to behavior, then you might uh, misinterpret an adolescent's behavior as, um, as you know, kind of the neurobiology of risk taking of the adolescent brain. Well, when you look at at um, the bird literature, so birds have these hierarchies, the pecking orders, I suppose, and high ranking birds have access to food. If there's a food, if it's a flock, for example, when they arrive um, at an, in a new region, the dominant birds have the first access to food. And, um, and so the, uh, and so the subordinate birds who are typically younger and not as big because the, the hierarchies are often about size and age are, are basically the adolescents, right? So you have these younger birds that are subordinate and they are, they have food insecurity because they don't know if they're going to be able to eat, even if there's food because the dominant birds are there. And so um, what ends up happening is a, it's a kind of exploitation of by the dominant birds of the hungry subordinates. And you see this, they do these experiments where um, they have this group of, of birds, some dominant, some subordinate. The dominants presumably um, less hungry, better fed, the subordinates hungry. They, they bring in a predator and all of the birds predictably um, flee into the bushes. But then what, that's when the experiment starts. And the investigators watch to see which birds are going to come out of hiding first. And they can't actually see the predator. So it's a kind of a prediction, right? They have to guess. They, have to, they don't, you know. And if you're the first bird to come out and the predator is still there, that was, that was a bad decision. But what this does is it protects the dominance 
um, consistently, it's the younger, food insecure, hungrier adolescent birds that come out to resume eating because they, like all wild animals, are navigating between this, these two straits of there's starvation and predation. And they are, um, they are forced to, to they, they have to take the greater risk and they suffer higher mortality. So I think that the, um, you know, who knows what our economy is going to look like, um, certainly the issue of food insecurity during COVID um, and, and beyond disproportionately, according to this Urban Institute paper, disproportionately impacts adolescents. Parents who, um, are, who, who don't have resources will often give priority to younger kids in terms of, of food, it's food resources. And so the vulnerability, the need to take all kinds of risks um, it is really amplified. So I think it's, um, yeah, we actually, this is an essay, I, I gave this as, the, as the, one of the midterm essays was to, um, to look at the bird literature and kind of try to, try to come up with some, some parallels and, and to, to be translational biologists. Right, and, and the issue of the isolation during COVID on these adolescents, what do you predict might be the impact long-term Right. Yeah, you know, I, I don't really have any predictions. I do. We do know from our, our work um, previously about isolation in animals that, you know, severe isolation is really a risk factor for um, some self-destructive behaviors from from in in birds, in many mammals and in humans. So, um, you know, hopefully the, you know, the kind of isolation that most kids have had is is just a kind of social, a lack of social experiences and those sorts of things, but more severe forms of isolation, yeah, can, can trigger psychopathology. I mean, there's, there's one other kind of interesting um, uh, component to this, you know, is will, will the generation that has basically spent a year and a half so closely with their nuclear families, um, you know, what, what will attachment look like? What will their differentiation, what will their individuation look like? What will their long-term relationships be? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we didn't talk about sex, but we, you know, a big part of the book is about the first time and, you know, sexual communication and, and all this and, and how it all happens. And um, one really kind of consistent theme is that it, it, it takes a long time to learn to communicate um, uh, in, when it comes to romance and 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 to understand what what the other individual is expressing back, and that some of the um, problems that we have with consent and it really is a are problems that have to do with inadequate ability to express and understand, um, and that there is concern that a lot of that has been that kind of courtship training, um, you know. For better or for worse, is, hasn't been happening. But I don't know. <laughs> well, we'll all have to read your next book as some of the uh, studies come out. I'm sure there'll be some very interesting observations um, about this period. Uh, there's a another question that we've received. It's about um, uh, should we worry about behavioral adaptivity related to climate change? given that we have this moving wall of climate impact. Yeah, no, it's such, it's so interesting. I was just looking at literature, looking um, at the impact of climate change on the age of, of menstruation, the age of menses, and uh, trying to correlate some of that to stuff that, that, that um, is being picked up on the, on the animal side. Um, you know, the, the most, I mean, there's some, I mean, ecological degradation, habitat destruction, climate, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. Um, one consistent effect is that the line that has traditionally separated human and so-called human and so-called animal environments, those lines are, have become blurred. And in many cases now, they are erased. I mean, COVID, right, and, and other you know, other zoonotic uh, diseases that are, you know, put us at risk for the next pandemic, those in a sense are a consequence of the, the blurring of the lines that used to separate, you know, animal and human um, ecosystems. Well, one of the 
consequences of that when it comes to climate is that, you know, we're, we are now, we and the other animals on planet Earth are sharing the same environments in many cases. And I'm not just talking about our dogs and our cats, right? It's, it's this kind of global experience that climate and other effects. And so it, it has got me to thinking about all of us, every species, including our own, that we are all now canaries and we're living, we're canaries living in this shared planetary coal mine. And so what, what, you know, what happens to us can be a sentinel. We can become a sentinel for animal health and what happens to all these other species can give us an early indication of what, um, what we're at risk for. And so when it comes to puberty, for example, um, the acceleration of puberty in some species that has been attributed to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment, um, or um, in some cases, uh, a shortening of hibernation, which leads to greater consumption of food, which leads to a hot, higher body mass index, which may lead to earlier puberty. You know, these, these global effects may be, um, you know, we are, we are now, we are now canaries, all of us, all species in this shared planetary coal mine. In other words, uh, which means to me that it's a really, um, it's a pretty good argument that as physicians, we can no longer afford to have this homo sapien centrism, that the blindfold of human exceptionalism may be literally preventing us from seeing, recognizing um, effects in other species that may be very meaningful, may actually be predicting risk to us. So that was a little bit off of adolescence, but, uh, but I believe that so deeply. And uh, Are those factors the same ones contributing to um, puberty uh, in humans being um, at younger ages these days? Are those the same yeah. or different? Well, I'm yeah, well, bo well, body mass index, so, so overnutrition, right, is, is definitely a factor, probably not the only factor, but that's one of the factors that's associated with earlier puberty. And um, we do know that there are some wild animal species that are getting heavier, uh, not, to the, not to what we would call obese, although we did write about um, some animals that are obese, actually wild animals. But, but uh, for example, um, the, the, Climate, a climate-related change in the duration of hibernation has resulted in um, certain marmot species. Um, th they basically start to eat earlier in the season. So they're, they're, the number of calories they're consuming is greater than ever before. And as a result, they're getting heavier. And so since puberty is going to be a function of, of, to some extent, of body mass, which makes sense, right? We see there's this adaptive switch that we see in mammals, at least, where when, when, you know, when body fat falls below a certain level, there's a cessation of ovulation. Uh, presumably, as an adaptive response, the body is, is responding to the environment, which is saying, hey, there's not enough calories here to support uh, a new life. So, you know, don't, don't be ovulating right now. So, and we know we see that in, in, in our species when, when, you know, when women fall below a certain weight, et cetera. So body weight, um, body mass, fat to skeletal muscle mass, all of those things are related to the onset of puberty and then the, you know, the, the reproductive cycle. Great. Um, well, I, I personally have one question to ask you, and that is, what is what are you thinking about uh, for your topic of your next book? Yeah, so is um, there a next book? Oh gosh, I, I I've just I'm just having the best time. I um, yes, I mean, right now I'm really interested in female health, and I've been looking at um, mental health and female health. But I've been looking at my my current project is um, I I have. I call it uh, female health across the tree of life. And I'm looking at two major um, sort of categories. I'm looking at the shared vulnerability that we as females have with other female mammals. So the shared vulnerability to breast cancer, which I've written about um, a fair amount before, the shared vulnerability to endometriosis, which I um, have a nice paper on that almost done.
you to um, peripartum, postpartum um, maternal, I mean, I don't call it depression, but, but I, it's postpartum depression in our species. And in um, this study that I'm right now in the, in the midst of, looking at these um, syndromes in horses, uh, sheep, goats, and pigs, where a mother will um, refuse nursing, and in some cases actually um, be violent with um, with the neonate. Um, and these are these are seen primarily in agricultural animals treated with oxytocin, arguing for some shared mechanism with postpartum depression. So so part of the project of female health across the tree of life is is the vulnerability to these disorders, which again, human exceptionalism. I didn't learn in, I, this is not the way you learn in medical school. But the other side is this um, project where I'm looking and I've been studying giraffes and other female animals um, for physiology that um, is essentially provides a solution. So these are natural animal models. The uh, so the leading cause of heart failure in women is um, caused by hypertension and a thickening of the left ventricle. And um, so I've been in Denmark studying giraffes, um, and I was supposed to be in South Africa uh, continuing that study um, to show this the ability of the giraffe heart, uh, which because giraffe hearts face very high blood pressure because of the the long neck and the distance of the giraffe brain from his heart. So their blood pressures are about 280 to 300. And they have a thick ventricle, but they don't have any stiffness in their ventricle because they're prey animals. So, so I'm studying all of these wonderful um, adaptations of, of other, species, other female species, pregnant in some cases, non-pregnant, um, to find solutions uh, to, you know, major challenges in, in women's health. So I'm, I just, all of it is so much fun. And, and I'm back at UCLA now, I've been since the pandemic and um, had this a wonderful group of UCLA undergraduates who are um, just working hard and um, we're publishing stuff and they're presenting in, at international conferences. So, and they're all women, not, we'd be happy to be happy to have some guys on the team, but um, yeah, so so those are the sort of the, the current, uh, that's, that's my current fun. Well, great. We're going to keep tabs on your uh, developments and look forward to whatever comes next. But it was a wonderful presentation and the book is phenomenal. And thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Um, we are really thrilled to have you and to learn all these wonderful insights from you and from your book. Um, so. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. I'm so honored and happy. I'll, I'll be with you guys anytime. So <laughs> great. Thanks. Thank you very much.